Well, thank you. Over to you. Welcome. And uh, fantastic also to follow from those remarks, actually. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you have heard of Dark Trace? Wow, that's a lot. Um, OK, so rather than go through the spiel of how amazingly quickly we've grown, I'm just going to say one thing about diversity, which is I'm super proud of working at Dark Trace also, not only because of the amazing work we do and the huge amount of um, intelligence and intellect and sort of that stimulating spirit, but from a diversity point of view, actually, little known fact, Dark Trace is led by two female CEOs. Um, and we have about, I think it's 40, 45% of the workforce is uh, female. So we have an extraordinarily high male to female ratio. And this was actually achieved without quota. But for anyone who wants to talk about diversity and how we've managed to grow so phenomenally quickly and innovate in so many different product areas, I'll be happy to have a chat with you about that later. So you've all heard about Darktrace. I don't know how many of you, however, know that Darktrace is also very applicable, and we have a whole product line uh, dedicated to email security. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. Darktrace has always been in the business of detecting and responding to in-progress attacks. And for those of you then who know us, we'll be quite familiar with the slide. See some nods? So we are the immune system approach. Um, Bear with me for those who have heard this before. It, it's inspired on the notion that our immune systems are really the most advanced form of defense, which is tailor-made to each, every individual in this room. It knows what is part of self and what is not part of self, and therefore, when it encounters something that bypasses the perimeter uh, defenses and gets into our bodies and starts being a little bit wonky, a little anomalous, and a little bit strange, it mounts a proportionate defensive reaction. And that's exactly what Darktrace does. We use AI to learn what we call the pattern of life of each, every one of the organizations. And what is the pattern of life? Well, it's the sum total of all the interactions that make each and every one of your companies unique, each and one, every one of your working environments. Not only how servers, with what frequency and patterns, talk to other servers and machines, but also how humans interact. How do people talk to each other? And this is something that we've now started seeing is being very much um, become now the focus of a lot of new methodologies of attacks. Attackers will tend to go for the least protected, the most vulnerable piece of the chain. And that often is tricking a human being into an, into an inadvisable action. But let me step out of this for a second. And uh, just let's think about AI for a sec. And specifically, the creation of what AI has been able to create. Don't, it's very, very fast, so please apologize for that. But there's one commonality between all of these people. None of them exist. These are all AI-generated faces that takes photos of existing humans and patches them together, and we have new faces. We've seen this before. We've seen this for many years, taking existing materials to create a new thing. Then one of the articles that I think it came out last year, two years ago, um, and I was very curious uh, to read some more and actually purchase one of these, is this piece of art. Now, when I look at this, I have the same sort of uh, relaxation, sort of serenity feeling that I get sort of when I look at one of the Grand Masters, maybe some water lilies in a pond. But the incredible thing, which if any of you are art experts, will be able to probably tell that there's some telltale signs that this is actually not one of those grand masters that belongs in the National Gallery. Well, maybe it does belong in the National Gallery, but the crazy thing about this painting was that it was actually created by an AI engine in about two weeks. We had an AI on one side that was learning the essence, what makes great art great art. And it then started painting. We had an AI on the other side that was very good at detecting and telling, OK, this is a painting, this is not a painting. Every time that the detector would say this is not a painting, the painting AI would have to get better. And so off they went and they battled for two weeks. And this is the outcome. The, in my opinion, a quite uh, remarkable piece of art, which I personally would be very happy with it hanging in my living room. And so we've taught, we're getting really good at teaching AI how to be human or how to imitate being human. And as we imitate being human, the next level of creativity, and something that I'm sure 
high school students all around the world will appreciate is getting AI to write prose. This is a headline actually from about a year ago. An AI that writes convincing prose risks mass producing fake news. I was too tempted not to try this in actuality. And so I went and I found one of these uh, AI engines online and I fed it this morning this sentence. Can I please underline, because I see it's being recorded, this is fake. I invented this phrase. The UK has announced its intention to close the borders to Chinese citizen. I had just actually come through from Heathrow this morning. There's a number of health posters and warnings in place um, due to the outbreak of the coronavirus. We're being very vigilant and we're being careful. But of course, there's also the rays of fake news out there, fake reports that are coming out. And how do we combat those and how do we identify those? So I thought, OK, well, what can I, an AI engine invent in terms of news fed only from this sentence? And it automatically completed the following article. China's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital has been condemned by the United States and Europe as diplomatic dead end that would poison the Middle East peace process and risk a new nuclear arms race. OK, wow, I didn't even expect it to go that way, personally. I thought it was going to be all about viruses and health scares and fever. But actually, I then stopped and I thought it, it reads like real prose. There is nothing about this that would give it away that it was built, actually written by an AI and not by me or by someone else. So this is a very, very real and very, um, it, it's not something we're aspiring to. This is technology that nowadays can create prose. I mean, we've had it in our smartphones for many years, right? Text predictor, what's the next button? Some of you sometimes not wanting to give in and press the next word so you don't have to type it out, but I know you want to. Well, that's the AI, right? Predicting your human pattern of life, your own style of communication. Why am I going on about all of this? Because this is the next frontier of really where cyber defense, we need to regain the advantage back. It's in our email inboxes. Because we have become quite accustomed to spotting, and thank you very much, James Veach, for making spams and scams his living. Have you guys ever heard of this guy, James Veach? He's a very, a very funny comedian who has taken time to respond and answer to spam emails. But of course, the spam emails shouldn't be in our inboxes to begin with. We should have technology that is good enough to allow us to identify what should and is not what is and is not a legitimate email. But that's actually really hard to do, right? You know this. If I ask how many of you use email, I'm sure everyone will put their hands up. If I ask how many of you have had an email problem as well from a security point of view, Unfortunately, very likely, we would have a vast majority of hands go up as well because it is an easy access and it's easy to get through with something like this. Now, James will respond to this uh, and go off and be James. But for some of us, instead, we are contending with emails in our inboxes that are very, very legitimate looking. For any of you who have heard me present in the past, I've been at one of these events before, or my coworker um, and co-founder, Dave Palmer, one of the co-founders of Darktrace, he has once received this email. And uh, it wasn't today. This was actually from a few years ago now. Dave had gone off to get coffee. And I'll give you a moment to read it, but just by way of context, Dave had gone off to get a coffee, and somebody overheard a conversation he was having with a colleague and managed to send this in to us, or him. I'm currently evaluating and reworking the training material for customers and partners. I've created a short test for trainees to see if they've achieved their learning objectives. Reasonable. Uh, Simon helped me with the macros in the background for the evaluation of the answer, because he really is an Excel wizard. Would you mind checking the questions to see if they're too difficult? Your experience here is much appreciated. Thanks, Matt. Signature, Matthew Nevada. Matthew Nevada is legitimately one of our trainers at Darktrace. And um, everything about this was plausible, including the fact that this was a project they were working on, as somebody probably overheard. The telltale, the giveaway, is that Matt is not this nice. <laughs> Thanks, much appreciated, exclamation mark, and smiley face? I don't think so. So we see this uh, wanting to mimic the communication style. And this was actually very, very well done. 
uh, and kudos to whoever wrote it. But unfortunately, whoever wrote it didn't have the experience of what that pattern of communication is between the people. And what we've actually already found, and it's been reported since, I think, a year and a half ago, is the first hallmarks of little bits of malware, little bits of spyware that have been dropped into some uh, corporate networks. And all they do is they listen in. In, uh, I've been told by my colleagues, apparently in the spy world, a very common thing is to switch on your microphone on your phone or to make a phone call and leave the phone underneath someone's seat in the car to overhear what they're saying. That is the equivalency in the cyber world. They're just dropping in little bits to listen and learn. And then the next version of this might be a very well-crafted email that instead is much more in line with the tone. I want to show you a couple of other examples of things we've seen in, out there. And this one is an email um, that we detected at one of our customers. It's an email that is, you know, it's a clean email. There are no links. There are no attachments. There's absolutely nothing here to give it away as being fake. Um, Hi, James. Hope you're well. Following your recent case of fraud, I've had to change my bank details on short notice. Please, can you update your systems with the following information? Mrs. C. Timms. Chantal Timms, um, CEO of the company, was, well, not her real name, but the CEO of the company had been spoofed. Somebody impersonated her and sent an email in claiming to be her, claiming to be from a personal email account while she was off on vacation, and please can you update my records? And this is where it starts getting a little uncomfortable. And uh, I've definitely received once a phone call from somebody who sounded a lot like the assistant of my boss telling me my boss had told me to do something. I was like, really? Can I trust you? I'm not sure. I don't know who you are. And unfortunately, this was actually a spoofed email. There was nothing about this was true. And we're seeing this on the rise. There are no signatures. There, there's no rule that one could write to prevent this kind of thing from being blocked. So this is where we needed to learn, turn to AI, and I would say dark trace AI, to help you in fighting back. Humans alone have no shot at telling what's the difference between this and a fake email. Oh, well. My apologies. Between the various uh, tra planes, trains, and automobiles from the moment, I think I misformatted this. Great opportunity, by the way, for our graphics department to give rise to the digital fake a la Star Wars Skywalker poster. You guys seen Star Wars? Probably less of a box office hit. So we have three things happening. The rise of the digital fakes, as we call them, these want to be deep fakes, these fake emails, these impersonation AI-powered emails are happening, and they're on the rise. And we've also seen reports from Microsoft saying that spear phishing has had a threefold increase by volume of email. And they're getting really good at stopping it when we can detect it. So the time has, changed, the time has come to up our game and fight back on the emails also with AI and go beyond the sort of traditional tools that we've used. This is because also not only is it impossible to distinguish between what is legitimate and what is not legitimate with our own eyeballs and limited brain capacity. Also, they're moving at incredible speeds. These are devastating machine speed attacks. And so how does an AI engine, how is it capable of looking beyond what's there and understanding that it's fake when a human can't? Well, I just want to give you one, two more examples. And then I think we have a bit of time. We'll just be on time. Um, for one education company, they suffered what we're just going to call a we transfer attack. It was a spoofed email that actually was very, very sophisticated, and it hit five of their users. Um, five of them received this, and essentially it was devastatingly fast and well thought out. And when we were then able to work with the customer and find out how had it bypassed existing tools and how had it got in, how was it able to do this, we found actually a lot of small uh, flags, small indicators, weak indicators, but that collectively actually gave it a whole different picture. So this, what we're seeing here is just three little screenshots of sub screenshots of um, Antigena email. That's our autonomous response for email. But so here we can see that there's metrics up at top, depth and width. Depth and width, there is marked at 27 and 162. These are metrics that show that there is actually connections and there's been existing correspondence 
between the sender and the receiver. So this is an established relationship. The sender has actually legitimately been sending information to the recipients for many days um, and also to many different addresses within the same organization. So this is an, very much an established relationship. Within the email that pretended to be from WeTransfer, there was a button, and the button would have linked to something. And analyzing that link, we actually found a couple of weird stuff there. We had an, uh, an, an anomalous link, an inconsistent link. This was slightly different than the rest of the WeTransfer, or what appeared to be WeTransfer communications. Rare hidden link, a spoof sender, so indicators that actually who claimed to be sending the email wasn't actually who was sending the email because we also saw things like um, an address IP anomaly score, which was very high. So putting all these things into context, we were actually able to fi figure out that this is more likely than not, not a legitimate email, and in fact it wasn't. And then apart from those pr parameters there, we were then able to understand some other things. There are indicators of spoofing. There was already a moderate communication history there through a wide distribution. So we were able to very quickly contextualize this back to our humans and the human defenders to understand, actually, this is part of a bigger incident. And even though it was only one person who had reported it, it's thanks to this wider distribution that we were able to put it in context of the bigger business. Who else was affected and very quickly intervened there. I was recently with uh, the Natural History Museum. They are a customer of ours and um, have been huge uh, adopters of AI. And I was speaking with Ian, their interim CIO, and Ian was telling me about how and why they decided to use Antigena email. Um, they had a very devastating attack that had gotten through. It was actually stopped pretty quickly, but then just the pain of restoring and figuring what had gone on, and just trying to get everything back up to normal, made them realize that actually they wanted antigena email on top of things. And in chatting with Ian also and with Chris from the team, they told me a, a, an interesting story, which is of course, not mailboxes are created equal. And essentially, the point there was also that you need to be careful and you need to be very surgical in how you're treating the different, those different mailboxes or those different users, right? because the communication between privileged individuals or VIPs who are exposed, public personas, CXOs, is very different than instead an open inbox that is very much taken under attack, such as their recruitment uh, alias. So the Natural History Museum proactively advertises, such as with this advert here on LinkedIn, that they want inbound applicants to send their uh, application via email to an inbox. And so this inbox is all sorts of weird because it's not just the legitimate applicants who are getting their emails in, but it's also all sorts of attackers and hackers that are trying to use this as a point of entry into the Natural History Museum's infrastructure. And so it's really only with something that is as surgical as AI that is capable of understanding everything from the very, very vast quantities, but also to be able to act and understand the single user the single mailbox, the single profile, that's where really the game changes. And we need to be able to turn to those AI, which unfortunately won't make you a cup of tea in the morning, but it will go a long way in helping you stay safe in your communications. With that, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed.